Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Good afternoon, Tom. Thank you for being here today. What we're doing today is a fireside chat addendum. That is all the questions that we missed that came from the MBT forum. Sometimes the people who are present at the fireside chat have uh, more questions and sometimes they don't get answered and they get piled up. So that's what we're here for today is to answer your questions that you've submitted through the forum. And we really appreciate all of the questions that um, you send through there. They're some of our best questions. Yes, and Don, I'd just like to add that that forum is a very important thing. Uh, you know, more people should go there. It's a space where people can help other people learn. You know, we have some people there who've been around an MBT for decades and really understand it very well. And, and other people who come there to, or who are beginners and ask questions. And it's really a good place to get your questions answered and to, uh, to hang out if you're looking for people open and willing to discuss these things about mind and consciousness and normal being, you know, paranormal being normal and all mm -hmm. those sorts of things. So it's a good idea to get those forum questions and get them answered because that forum is an, an important place. So thank you for True. pulling, thank you for pulling them up off the bottom of the pile and let's okay. get them, at, let's get yeah. them answered. All right, let's do that. Um, I also want to point out that there's a wealth of information that when uh, in the early days, Tom had a little bit more time, he would answer questions very in, in length. And also when Ted was with us, he gave some val very valuable information and all of that is saved on the forum. So uh, do check it out. Well, Tom, let's get to the first question here from uh, Pipe Man on his question is, and this is on uh, consciousness, and um, why do some individuated units of consciousness incarnate here who know they will be severely disabled? In some cases they would know. Why would a human consciousness incarnate in an avatar that has such limited decision space? Okay, that's a question that I, I hear a lot. Uh, sometimes it's in the form of why would a why would a, a free will awareness unit when it incarnate to some to some little um, child that's born in the midst of poverty, in the midst of famine, where it's unlikely that uh, he'll live more than six or seven or eight years before starving to death. You know, why would any uh, Free will awareness unit, you know, incarnate into somebody who was really poor or, as you say, disabled, maybe uh, severely mentally retarded or with some kind of a disease that would be debilitating or even, even one that would be fatal. Well, there's, there's several answers for that. And one is that when you incarnate, you're not really assured of what exactly is going to happen. It depends on when you, dis when you pick up a situation, what the probabilities are at that time. So let's say some you're ready to incarnate and a situation is picked that looks like it will suit you very well. And you accept that. And now, once you accept it, you're there to to take that ride, to take that set of experiences for, you know, whatever comes. So it might be that that uh, fetus will develop and have some kind of a medical problem, or something that uh, was unlikely happens in the in the growth. You know, sometimes some parts will grow normally and other parts abnormally, and that all doesn't happen right at the instant of conception. All of that happens at different stages during the development of that fetus. And once birth, sometimes situations that were lovely and sweet suddenly turn sour because daddy loses his job or gets run over by a truck or you know, mom 
has something happened to her. So things happen and we accept those because all experience gives us opportunities to grow. All experience gives us opportunities to grow. Now, most of the time, if we do know that there's something like that, if there is some sort of birth defect or, or like I say, a famine going on or that kind of thing, and, and a, a free will awareness unit would, a free will awareness unit would have prior knowledge of it, they still are likely to select that because it has a couple of very good aspects to it. One, the decision space is smaller, therefore it's a little less complicated. It's a little less difficult. And I, I make the analogy that swimmers often just don't go jump in the deep part. They often will go to the shallow part and walk down the stairs and kind of just get used to getting wet a little bit before they take the deep plunge. Well, that only makes good sense. So if you're first, if you're in the first uh, stages of taking your plunge into the virtual reality that uh, we call our physical universe, and this is the first few times you're going to have an avatar, finding a situation with a smaller decision space is probably a good idea. It won't be quite so overwhelming, and that may be a good place to start. And people who are in severely constraining environmental circumstances like poverty or famine, uh, people who are born, say, uh, severely mentally retarded, or people who are born uh, with handicaps, you know, no legs or no arms or something like that, they have somewhat limited decision space. They also have something else. They often have a situation where they can experience love, complete and total you know, unconditional love. Because when you love a child like that, it's not because of what you expect to get from them, what you expect them to give back. It's because you just love them. You do because you do. It's unconditional. And even in poverty, you see pictures of the, you know, the mother in poverty, and she's got, you know, maybe a a four-year-old and a two-year-old and a baby nursing, and they all, you know, the, the little the little boy has a bloated belly because you, you know, from parts of his starvation, and they all look like skeletons with skin, you know, stretched across bones, and it's really, really sad. But you see, they smile, and they play, and they share, and there's no, uh, you know, when the when the food gets handed out by the relief workers or something, it gets shared, it gets passed around. Nobody's grabbing to try to take it away from others. So they, they actually get to live in a pretty benevolent space emotionally and psychically, even though they live in a horrible space physically. Physically, they may not live very long, but they live in a limited decision space, not too complex, but one that has a lot of carrying involved in it. Now, that's not always. Sometimes, you know, these disasters have very little carrying involved in it. But that's usually, you know, the depends on how that cookie crumbles. You know, it depends on what happens once the once the experience starts to unwind, how that folds out. So all of those desperate situations aren't necessarily as desperate as they look like. We tend to put ourselves in that space. Oh, if I was there, oh, how horrible that would be. Here I am sitting with plenty and, you know, basically can have everything I want. And I see some poor mother or, or child sitting there with, with nothing, absolutely nothing, not even a glass of drinkable water. And think how horrible that would be, but that's their life. That's just the way they've been. They've accepted that that's their life. They're not shaking their fists. They're not angry. They're just existing as best they can with what they've got. They're sharing. They're caring. And it is what it is. So there's growth in that. You know, that's, that, is, um, that is a space in which one can grow up some. 
So it's not necessarily there's long lines of people waiting to incarnate into those places because you get to grow so much as it is that any situation is the situation you can grow up in. So now if you're on the other side of the world and you see those, those kids or those parents struggling like that, and you kind of look at them and say, eh, not my problem. Well, that's a choice you have. And that's a choice that will take you backwards. That kind of self-centeredness and uncaring will help you to evolve. But if you say, wow, that's really something. Sure, I can donate to that charity. I can give something to the Red Cross or the food fund or whoever's helping out over there. I can be part of the, I can't, I'm not going to fly over there and, and try to do something because one, I don't, wouldn't know what to do. I'm not trained. I have no idea. I don't speak the language. I just be in a way, but I can provide resources. I can uh, maybe work here in their offices and do coordination and do other things. If I, if I have say time free for volunteering or whatever. So you can still be part of the solution and you can still have the empathy and connection such that you see these people not as just some outsider somewhere that doesn't mean anything to you that's having a hard time, but you see that some part of your human family is in distress and you have a, you'd like to do something about that if you could. And maybe you can't, maybe you're not in a position to send money. But even if you just have an identification with them empathetically, that helps you grow up. That's a positive thing, you see. So the mentally retarded who are severely mentally retarded, they do several things. They live a life of very limited decision space. They can love, they can care, they can hug, they have feelings. And they interact with other people, people who are not mentally retarded, people who have to treat them specially, treat them with caring, treat them with understanding, with kindness. And as they move through the world of, of, of non-retarded people, they're giving lots and lots of people chances to grow up by the quality in which they interact with them with them and each other. So they're good examples for us, for us to find compassion and caring and find a little extra time. And well, let's not bother with those people. They're not on my way to success. See, that's a de-evolution kind of thought. So all in all, it works out for everybody. The people who are severely retarded, they get to learn and feel and love. The people around them who know them, they get some opportunities to be less self-centered and to care and to give and to love. And everybody wins. So why not? You're going to incarnate into, into thousands of different roles, thousands of different situations. And if you always pick the same one, oh, I want to be upper class, rich, and, you know, whatever, and that's all you do, you won't evolve very quickly because your set of experiences will all be about the same with the same choices over and over again. And it just isn't going to challenge you in a way that's going to help you grow up much. So people don't do that. So you're going to spend some time in all sorts of situations and roles because all of those situations will, will challenge you in different ways. So why wouldn't people want to, you know, take up, avatars in those roles. There's not that many of them. It's not like that's the great majority. They're a small minority of the seven and a half billion people on the planet. Well, at least a minority, you know, depends how, you know, how you define poor, but that's an educational role to be in. It's one where you can learn a lot. And that's what this is all about. It's not about how good it feels and how happy you are and how much you know, beer you get to drink, you know, how many cookies you get to eat, you know, how much money you have to spend. It's not about any of that. It's not how comfortable your life is. It's about what are you going to learn? How much are you going to grow up? Or how much are you going to de-evolve? So all those spaces, if you will, in, uh, in the game, all those seats in the game, that seem to have distressed players, all those players are learning something. And there's a place in there for all of us to get some experience. 
so that we know what it's like to be on that side of that coin. All right, thank you, Tom. We'll move on to the next question. The next question is from Yana, and she is a Russian immigrant who discovered your books several years ago and is trying to read through them slowly, but has found your YouTube channel and has found a lot of uh, information that's very valuable to her. Uh, she's collecting nuggets of wisdom that for many years that you have uh, put out in some of your uh, videos mm -hmm. and it's changed her life greatly. So she thanks you. Her question is she has always been very um, questioning whether she wants to live or not, but not in a suicide way, questioning why she's always so, uh, there's this underlying sadness and she remembers as a child being this way, always quiet, crying a lot. And the other part of her question is, she receives a lot of intuitive information and how can she organize and manage all of this? Well, it's a good question because that is what she needs to do is organize and manage all of this. She's exactly right. Uh, probably the negative parts, the sadness, the crying, come from a sense of negativity about herself. People who feel negative in some way about themselves often have bouts of depression, even if it's not clinically depressed, but where they just don't feel good. You know, uh, like, I just want to get off this ride. Or I could just see myself just floating away into, you know, never, never land or floating away and just not being here. And that doesn't sound scary at all. It actually sounds pretty good. You know, just leaving, getting off this ride. Typically, people who have those feelings have negative feelings about themselves. They feel inadequate. They feel unlovable. They feel less competent than they think they should be or less valuable than, than they think they should be. So that they see themselves as, as uh, oh, I don't know, kind of failures in, in many ways. And mostly it's because one, they have a very high standard of what it is they, they think they should be. You know, that's, that's way up here. You know, I need to be perfect and they're not, and that's a problem. Or they have fears at a very deep level that usually come from childhood about feeling insecure, not worthy. And we get those fears from the silliest things. We get those, those fears from little details where a parent may just kind of push you aside because they're busy and say, no, not now. I can't, I can't deal with you now. And maybe they're in the middle of something really major going on in their life or something they have to deal with or something happening. And they don't mean that you're unworthy, but you take it that way. Oh, I'm not good enough. If I were good enough, it wouldn't push me away like that. So, that's not the case. It's not that mom and dad's being cruel. It's just that's the way you take things when you're five years old and four years old. You, you internalize everything. When you're very young, you're very self-centered and everything is about you. And uh, no matter what happens, you internalize it as being about you. You know, children are infamous for feeling guilty when their parents get divorces. They feel guilty about it. Well, obviously a parent's divorce isn't caused by the children very often. That would be pretty rare. It has all kinds of other issues, but the children aren't the main reason for the divorce. But many children see that. It's the same thing. When you're, when you're small, when you are uh, uh, very young, you're self-centered. You tend to be insecure because you're small and everything else is big, and everything tends to be about you. It's just the way you interpret the world. So those feelings get left over and we feel that way from when we're little and now we're 40 or 50 or 60 years old and we still feel that way, but we can't put a name on it. We don't know why. We just have this sense of 
oh, you know, it's, life is hardly worth it. You know, it's just, I'm just not doing all that much. I'm not, you know, my life doesn't mean a whole lot. I'm not accomplishing anything. I could just float out of here and probably nobody would miss me. You know, you have those kind of negative attitudes. And for the most part, those attitudes are just not true. It's just a belief. And to go find the fear that drives that belief might be the thing that will help you get rid of it. But if you can't find that fear, if it's just was a whole series, a whole list of little tiny things in your life that have all added together to make you have that negative feeling about yourself. And if you're, if the bar you put, you set for yourself, this high level bar of perfection uh, is unreasonable. Well, think about those things and see if you can't come to terms with it. And if you can't still have the intent, I don't want to be like that. And when you first start to go into that slip, slide down that hole, catch yourself early on and say, well, I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to be that way. I'm okay. I'm fine. Life is good. I don't want to be that way. And you won't, you won't go to the bottom. If you let yourself slide all the way to the bottom to where you're, you're, you know, ready to leave, in, a, in a, uh, a mild, if not clinical depression, then it's hard to turn it around at that point because then you justify all the negative things about yourself. But to catch yourself right in the beginning of that decline and just say, I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to be that way. And think positive. Think of positive things. Start listing all the positive things in your life. Start wallowing in gratitude rather than wallowing in self-pity. See, that's often self-pity is where we go when we fall down that hit, fall down that uh, slippery slope. The bottom of that slope is self-pity. So, wallow in gratitude rather than self-pity. And if you spend some time wallowing in gratitude you begin to smile and everything will, you know, the sun will come out again and you'll feel very, very good about yourself. So those are some of the things to think about. Now, as far as you're seeing um, beings, seeing, uh, getting information, uh, things that are um, non-physical, being intuitive, picking up on people's feelings and emotions, that goes hand in hand sometimes with being a child that has had a difficult upbringing, a child with a difficult life, depending how difficult it is, if it's very difficult, that child tends to retreat into their inner space. They retreat into the intuitive world because that world is fun and happy and has no pain in it. Whereas the physical world, is full of pain, full of hurt. So when these children grow up, they find out that the paranormal things often come easy to them because they've spent a lot of time in that intuitive space, the space where all the par paranormal things happen. So they're familiar with that space because they, they grew up with you know one foot in that space as their escape from the unpleasantness of the physical. So the fact that you have these depressions and you are very empathetic and you see things that are paranormal all kind of falls into a, you know, a pattern that I've seen many, many times. Well, the way you deal with the negativity is to just be authentic, be totally authentic, be who you are and say, that is good enough. I'm going to be me. I have the courage to be me and let those chips fall where they may. Now, I'll look at the chips afterwards and see, was that good or was that bad? You know, do I need to change or do I need to change my friends, you know, and change, you know, my, my environment? And you'll make choices and decisions and you'll grow. But just start with just being yourself and being okay with that, whoever that is, and then grow from that part forward because you can't change yourself till you own yourself. You can't get rid of a piece of yourself until you own that piece. So owning it is the first step. Be authentic 
after that, let the growth happen the way it grows. Okay, so that's another way to approach the problem. So just enjoy your, your non-physical things. You don't have to make a whole lot of them. Just realize that they're there. That's a part of you because you have explored and developed that intuitive side of yourself. And that's good. Eventually, with practice, you'll be able to rely on those, those uh, paranormal things. They'll become natural, part of your life, and very reliable. And that's good. So you'll just have a little bigger decision space than people who don't have that access. So good for you. You know, play with it, uh, have fun with it, use it, don't abuse it, and uh, see if you can't uh, employ it to help you care more effectively for other people. All right, Tom, thank you. We'll go on to George's question from the MBT forum, George T. We all know that mainstream science nowadays is just fact-based. All it cares about is acquiring more and more facts about the physical world. But while new scientific knowledge is created, it also tends to fix the possibilities in one possible outcome. So my question is, the scientific research of the physical world collapse probability distribution in this virtual reality into narrow band of possibility Thus, restricting avatars from having more diverse experience in the future? Well, yes and no. It does limit not the avatars, but I know what you mean. The free will awareness unit displaying avatars is really what you mean. Um, it does restrict the free will awareness unit, the consciousness, um, from what they can think because it gives them beliefs. If they believe that this is a materialistic world and that that's the nature of reality, then that closes their mind to other possibilities and other information comes up to the contrary and they just pass it off or deny it. So yes, that limits their decision space, but it doesn't limit the possibilities. So it limits decision space. People become close-minded because they have beliefs in a particular theory or a particular model of reality, and they reject everything else. But it doesn't change the possibilities. The possibilities of world being different are still there. So that distribution of the possibilities is still just the same. Now, some of the probabilities may be skewed depending on you know, what the situation is, what, what thing we're talking about may be skewed because some things will be more probable with these people who are locked up in a belief in materialism, some things will be less probable for them. So people who are very materialistic probably don't have a lot of experience with synchronicity. They probably don't have a lot of experience with empathy, with being able to feel other people's feelings, understand other people's thoughts. Um, you know, they, they probably don't, aren't very good at uh, uh, understanding another person's world through that person's eyes. In other words, getting in that person's mind and seeing reality from their viewpoint. They kind of stuck in their own viewpoint, in their own space, looking at the world as a really a reflection of themselves. So, yes, that limits decision space, but not possibility. All those possibilities are still there. And all we have to do to access them is grow up. All right, Tom. The next question um, is also from George. And he wants to give you a little background of what got him thinking about this question. There's a popular animated series called Rick and Morty. Rick is a crazy genius and Morty is his grandson. In one of the episodes, Rick's car just won't start. It turns out that the battery for the car was created by Rick himself, and it's basically a little universe inhabited by the people to whom Rick is the God figure. Um, he says in your talks, you have said that we cannot know what is outside what you call the larger consciousness system. His question is, what is the possibility of this system evolving towards its goal um, within this type of 
power source uh, concept that he has, almost like a nesting. Uh, yeah. So the, what you're talking about is is uh, realities inside realities inside realities. If you had a Venn diagram, which shows relationships between things, you'd have a big circle, which was the outer reality. And within that, there'd be another circle, which would be the next reality. And in that circle would be the next reality within that, you know, and so on. Or we call that nested realities. And theoretically, that is entirely possible. You can nest realities, and theoretically, you can nest as many of them as you want. So that's possible, but it's not particularly practical. You know, the difference is that possibility means that conceptually it can be done, but when you take a practical look at it, it means could you really implement it? You know, could you implement it into a real system, something that would actually work? And if we think of that practical aspect, we'll see that you wouldn't nest very many realities before the difficulty in the computer science required to nest them grows and grows to the point that it's unwieldy. For example, um, each, each virtual reality that's inside the next. So let's say we have A. A is the outer one, and then inside of A, there's another virtual reality called B, and inside of B, there's another virtual reality called C. Well, if A no longer functions, then B can function and C can function. In other words, you pull the plug on A, and B and C immediately wink out because each one, you know, B is a product of A, and C is a product of B. So... If there's no A, there's no B or no C either. They're all linked. Well, that's a problem. If you've got this nice little reality chugging along down in C and they're making a lot of great progress and doing wonderful things and B or A somehow stumble and, uh, and mess up, well, the whole thing wipes out. You see, so that's not a clever way to build virtual realities. Uh, another problem is just the sheer, the sheer difficulty in programming such a thing because everything that happens down in C has to be a product of B. It has to flow through the logic of B. And everything that happens in B has to flow through the logic of A. In other words, it has to be within the possibilities and the structure and the rule set of A. So if you want to change something down in C, well, you have to relate that to A and to B before you can change it in C. In other words, all the changes have to flow down from A to B to C and from you see, that way. So that's a computing nightmare. Whereas if you wanted three realities and you had them all separate, A and B and C, and they're all separate from each other. Now, if A and B go belly up, well, it doesn't matter. C still chugs along. And if you want to make changes in B or C, you can just do that whether you make changes in A or not. One doesn't have to depend on the other, but where they're all in a dependence line, like all in a Venn diagram, where they all depend on, on uh, each other as they go through, the programming gets horrendous. It takes you know three or four times the trouble to do anything once you get down to reality C. So that's the problem. Though it is, it is possible, the system would not do that except maybe two levels maybe, because we're seeing two levels in our own world here. We're in a virtual reality called the physical universe, and we make virtual realities like the Sims. And those little Sims characters run around, and sure enough, if the power in the computer room goes off, the Sims disappear. Poof, they're gone, just like that. Doesn't matter how many players were in there, you know, it's just gone, because it depends on reality A. So, that's we did we have done that at two levels but notice each level that you're going to go down is likely to have to get simpler and simpler you can't have things in reality b that are more complex and have you know deeper um more what can we say higher resolution and everything else than what a can produce so one's the subset of the other which means every time you go down a level, it's very likely that they're going to get simpler and simpler and simpler. 
So sure enough, The Sims is a very simple reality compared to this physical universe reality. And we could make The Sims a lot more complicated and maybe 50 years from now, The Sims will be a lot more complicated, but it's still never gonna be as complicated as a parent reality. So each reality has to be a little less as it goes down because it can't be more than the thing that created it. It's possibly it could be equal to, but it can't be more. And because of computer science constraints, it's very likely to be less. Because if you're making a virtual reality inside a virtual reality, you have to do that for a reason. And that reason has certain, you know, what design constraints for why you're doing it. And once you meet those design constraints, adding more resolution and more of this and more detail, all that becomes irrelevant. You're only going to do as much as you need for the reasons that you're doing it. So it's not likely you're going to make B just a carbon copy of A with all the things in it that A has. B is going to be simpler and C is going to be simpler and so on as you go down. So it's a very constraining process to nest them. That's the so that's the, uh, that's the problem with nesting. Theoretically possible, yes, they can have an infinite number, you know, all nested within each other. But in reality, no, not so much. It's not really going to happen. And a, a similar idea is the many worlds idea. The many worlds idea has all the possible things that could possibly happen, have happened in many worlds. So you have these nearly infinite number of physical realities, just like this physical reality, and each one of them is exactly like the other one, except it has a change. So, you know, I scratch my head with my right hand instead of my left hand, and a whole new universe. Not just this solar system, not just this planet, not just me, but a whole universe has to be created with me scratching my head with this hand instead of this hand. A little electron goes from spin up to spin down. A whole new universe needs to be created with that electron in two different things. So all the possibilities, and if you get down to the molecular <laughs> level and the subatomic particle level, yes, the number of required universes to represent every possible change would be enormous, beyond enormous. It would be uh, just unthinkable as a practical thing. So that's the many worlds theory, that you're going to have all these worlds that represent all the changes. And what our experience is that we're just hopping from world to world to world to world. And as we hop through these worlds, that represents the changes we make. So I hop into the world where I scratch my head with this hand, or I could hop into the world where I scratch my head with that hand. It's like that. Now, you can't have in this many worlds something that says, well, you know, whether you scratch your head with your right or left hand, it just really isn't all that important and it doesn't drive any happenings downstream. So we could just not worry about that. You can't say that because then somebody has to be the judge of what's important enough to take care of and what's not. Now we need a judge out there that says, well, is that important enough to make another world or not? You see? And because this whole idea is to produce a way that, that uh, determinism and materialism can produce non-local events, can do the things that consciousness can do, it's to explain those things, you see, and still keep it deterministic and whatever. So because of that, they can't have this other outside force because by definition there are no outside forces who can be the judge of whether this or this is really important or not important. It requires another intelligence to make a judgment and that defeats the reason for doing it in the first place is that there is no thing outside so you have to do it with everything. That's why you have to do it with the hands and the head or with electrons flipping and everything that changes has to be included. Each one each possible change. So anyway, it's another one of those things that is theoretically possible. Yes, you could have many worlds, but when it comes to the practical side of, is it implementable? No, it's ridiculous as a concept to be implemented. It doesn't work. 
Not yeah. very efficient. <laughs> no, way too complicated, way too much, you know, resources. It's just it's it's too hard to do. And it's not logical either. So it's theoretically possible. But you see, if in other if you have all these slices of possibilities, then the idea that what the physicists will tell you is that time doesn't really exist, but time of is an illusion of you jumping from disk to disk. Because when you jump from disk to disk, you have, you know, time's different. So I jump to this disk, it's a little further ahead. And that disk, you've got this sense of time flowing by, but that's just you moving through the movie. All the frames, it's like you have a frames of the movie, right? And they're all stills. But as you go through the frames of the movie, you see distance change, you see things move, you have time. It takes time to move. So. That's how they say that time is an illusion. It's illogical because it's a thing that, that you say is true because you define that it's true, therefore it's true. That's a circular logic that is not logical at all. How does one jump from frame to frame if there is no time? If time only exists as a as a, uh, an illusion because you're moving from frame to frame, then what allows that outsider to jump from frame to frame to frame? From the outsider's viewpoint, there must be time. Time now, and then I jump to the next one, time then, but yet I'm creating time by the jump, but yet I need time to make the jump that creates time. You see, that's, that's, just the, that's, a, that's a logical you know, snake swallowing its tail, right? I start with the premise that time exists, and then I come to the conclusion, therefore, time exists. So it, um, that's, their, I, that's their idea. Well, there are several illogical things there. The, as, as often uh, happens with materialists and these kinds of theories, they're cherry picking from what would be a virtual reality concept, that there is something outside this reality. Mm -hmm. And they're cherry picking the ideas that, yes, we, we, we believe in consciousness, but um, we're materialists. And it's a, it's a contradiction in definitions. Yeah. Well, maybe this is not the place to say that, but the idea that uh, the reality is deterministic and materialistic go together. You can't have a... Re uh, you can't have a materialistic world without a deterministic world and vice versa. So those two things are logically necessary. And if you're a determinist and a materialist, then you have to come to the, lo if you're logic, and if you're logical, you have to come to the conclusion that there is no such thing as consciousness. It's only illusion. There is no such thing as time. It's only illusion. There is no such thing as free will. It's only illusion. Okay, so that's what a materialist and a, and a determinist has to see time, consciousness, and free will as illusions. Okay, now, on the other hand, if you happen to see that time, free will, and uh, consciousness are real things, then you have to, and, and those three things are all logically necessary for each other. You can't have consciousness without time. You can't have, you know, free will without consciousness, without time. They all have to have all three of those things you need to have together. And if those are real things, then if you're logical, determinism is an illusion and materialism is just an illusion. So those two things are totally incompatible logically with each other. The problem is <laughs> for scientists is that it's common experience for everybody, every animal, every human being, it's a common experience to experience time, to experience consciousness, and to experience free will choice. Those things are everyday common experiences of everyone and everything that's conscious. So then it's a little hard to explain why they're all illusions. And then you come up with these silly devices like, you know, many worlds that have you skipping from, you know, from a deterministic set to deterministic set. And uh, that's how you generate time, but yet you have, to, you have to have prior time to the time you generate in order to make the jump. 
to create the time. So you need time to create the time. You see what I mean? That's a, that's, that's a, uh, that's the logic problem is you need time in order to create time. It's uh, illogical when you assume your result and then think that's logical. But anyway, that's just the nature of those two logical spaces. Thank you. That spun into very interesting, um, clear definitions. Uh, the next question, Tom, is from Zach McCracken. And on predictions in The Simpsons, I thought this might be a fun, interesting question for Tom <laughs> so, to ask. Sounds like it's going to be different, yes. <laughs> on several occasions, Tom has given examples of the LCS giving people a nudge to make them realize there might be more to this reality than they previously thought. I was wondering if the LCS might ever do this on a large scale through mass media. Case in point, on many occasions, the writers of the popular cartoon series, The Simpsons, have seemingly managed to predict the future, apparently foreseeing everything from Trump's presidency to 9-11. And he had a handful of examples the, the existence of the Higgs boson particle or God particle um, and different such things that uh, were presented in The Simpsons and 10 years later come true. Can, uh, can you comment on that? Okay. You know, you know, in a one word answer to your question is yes. Of course, the larger conscious system can you know, nudge people to put things into books and into movies and even into cartoons like The Simpsons that will help uh, form attitudes and ideas and open minds and do other things. Of course, the system can do that, and it does do that. And it does that often in the literary field, which the cartoons are part of that, uh, with what's called inspiration. People get inspired, people get aha moments, they get ideas, they get plots. Writers get plots and I'm sure the Simpson writers, you know, get their stories too from ideas, inspirations that just come, oh, we should do something on this. So yes, the system can indeed play that uh, game. On the other hand, the, the Sims is, is a, you know, social satire it's social criticism and when you're satire and when you're satirizing something you are doing a caricature a caricature is where you make something sort of look like what's out there but you exaggerate the points of it exaggerate the points to being fun being silly or being comical much like the the caricatures you get uh, at a you know, a theme park or something. Now, I've artists there will do a caricature of you. And if you happen to have ears that stand out a little or, or lips that are a little full or something, oh, they'll show the ears like, you know, like basketballs on side your head or the nose out here a foot long or they exaggerate anything that stands out a little about you. They will tend to exaggerate it. And that's caricature. And that's what satirists do too. They pick out things that are in the culture that are talked about in the culture and terrorist things have been bubbling around in the culture for, you know, for a long time. And so have, um, you know, diseases that, you know, plagues and that that's part of our culture. All these things are part of our culture. And as they rise up in the, in the uh, collective consciousness, it would just be normal for these writers to get some inspiration from these things that their culture is thinking about. And then, do a caricature and make something really, you know, exaggerated and funny, you know, come out of them. So yeah, the system can make those nudges, of course, but the, the collective consciousness is a great source of information for satirists and for comedians and for uh, writers. It's, uh, so it's kind of a natural thing to happen, whether the system's involved or not which makes it easy for the system to give it little nudges if it thinks those nudges will help wake us up. Thank you. Next question is from Nicholas from the MBT Forum on frightening near-death experiences. Tom, you've talked a lot about the afterlife in your theory, and I've been interested in the topic of NDE since I was very young. 
He's read a lot of literature, and it's a very rare occurrence, but they're, he's read about very frightening near-death experiences. Now, for the most part, these near-death experiences uh, are absolutely, there's absolutely no fear. Um, there's a very non-judgmental, very loving energy, bliss and conditional, unconditional love. There's a lot of accounts of that. But uh, his question is, what's going on in these rare cases of frightening near-death experiences? Okay. The first clue is that they are a small percentage. These are the minority, and a reasonably small minority. Uh, the second idea, to answer your question, is that it's not that people have a near-death experience and the system you know, hands them an experience. The experience that they have also has to do with them, their beliefs, their understandings, their idea of reality their idea of an afterlife. So if you are, a, if you have, say, a, a, a religious belief that when you die, you're going to, if you're really, really good, you'll end up in heaven. And if you're not so good, you're going to end up in hell. And if your life has been rather normal, which means you've been not so good, <laughs> you know, many times, which is typical for most people, then if you had this very strong belief, then you may have a strong fear about death and about heaven and hell. And if you do, particularly if this thought just happened to pass through your mind that, uh-oh, I might die on this operating table. I'm going to have open heart surgery and, you know, that works about 60% of the time and 40% of the time it doesn't, the people die. So I could die here. And then your thoughts of death and your thoughts of hell and your thoughts of heaven and your thoughts of redemption and your thoughts of, of uh, uh, prayer and all that stuff may kind of flip through your mind as these ideas pass through your consciousness. So if the idea that uh, it could be a horror, a horror waiting, awaiting you, happens to be in your mind, then that may be exactly what you experience. And the system, who would like you to have a nice experience, perhaps, or a, you know, welcome to consciousness land, and, you know, this is the land of love and peace and tranquility. Here, let me show you around. But the person may be walled off against that. You know, when you have a belief, you shut everything else out. Beliefs have that ability to, to build a wall around you. And anything from the contrary comes in, you reject it, you throw it away. Fear does that. Fear creates beliefs, and those beliefs take your decision space and narrow it down so that you can't think outside of that fear box. Well, I think that's what happens. And the reason most people have a positive experience, neutral to very positive, is that they're neutral to positive going into it. So the system can give them a nudge to have a particular experience, send them a data stream that is a, a really good experience. But if you take somebody who's really worried about how awful it might be, and are there going to be monsters out there, and so on, then if the system tries to send them a data stream with uh, you know, something positive in it, they'll probably reject it because they're so wrapped up around the negative things that they don't listen, they don't pay any attention. That's why it's a minority of people. Most people aren't that negative. Most people are open and uh, they don't plan on dying, they plan on living. <laughs> they, they don't go into it thinking they're going to die and worrying too much about heaven or hell. They just go into it saying, well, I'm gonna pull through this. So they're, they tend to be in a positive frame of mind. But some people don't. Some people go in with intrepidation. Oh, no, this is liable to be the end. Well, what does that mean? And if they go in with a lot of negativity and heaviness, then they're more likely to have a negative experience. So that's where it comes from. It's, it's not just the system giving you a data stream, but it's what you'll accept and what you'll process. 
And sometimes people will only process ugly things and scary things because that's their fear, their fear of death, their fear of, of going to hell, their fear of the unknown, all of those fears. You know, I'm going into something unknown here. Even if they're not religious, it's unknown. And just that fear of the unknown can put them into a panic to the point that no other message is going to get through. They're just kind of panicked and they're going to do something. They're going to have a negative experience. So that's why you get some of those. And I think it would be interesting to have a real thorough psychological profile done of all the people who have NDEs. And I mm -hmm. bet you'd find that the people who have positive experiences tend to be positive people. And the people that tend to have negative experiences tend to be negative people. That makes sense. It does. Uh, one, of, one little part of his question was, how can we better prepare to avoid uh, this fear of death? Well, the best way is to get rid of that fear so you don't have a fear of death. Now, the fear of death is a little complicated. Sometimes it's not just the fear of death. It's, it's wound up with a couple of other fears, one being the, the uh, loss of control and you know, people who, let's say, um, get on airplanes, as an example, and they're fearful, white knuckle airplane riders uh, gripping their, their, their hand rests so hard their knuckles turn white. Mostly that fear isn't so much a fear of death per se as it is a fear of being out of control. Their life depends on uh, somebody else, the pilot, the co-pilot, the mechanics, the people who built the aircraft. Certainly all those people, we know humans make mistakes. And what if somebody made a mistake and that mistake is going to blow up the plane? Well, that worries them because they like to be in control. And sitting in that seat, your life is 100% in the hands of other people. And they find that very disconcerting, that their life is no longer under their own control. So even though flying an airplane has a much lower probability of, of creating a you know, disaster or killing you than riding in a car, but they'll ride in a car because in a car, they're in control. And they're one of these people that have given the opportunity, they will drive. They would prefer to drive because that puts them more in control. Just to ride, again, if you're just a passenger, then you're not in control. And if you're a passenger and you continuously tell the driver what to do and what to look out for, well, that's just you needing control. Oh, watch out, watch that truck, watch this, watch that. If you are a backseat driver, it's because you're having control issues, letting somebody else do it. Or the person driving just isn't paying attention and you're trying to be helpful. You know, that's the way you see it. And probably both are true. Some aspects of both of those are probably true for most of us. We're a little antsy because we're not in control and that driver's not driving the way we drive. And that's a problem for us. So anyway, what can you do about it? You can get rid of the fear of having to be in control. You can get rid of the fear of dying and you can, you can, uh, uh, let's see, there's one more. You can, uh, get rid of the fear of the unknown. That's the third one. You know, if you fear the unknown, then that is another one. You don't have to be religious. You can just have a big fear of the unknown and it creates about the same sort of, of uh, mindset, the same sort of fears. So the best thing to do is to learn to meditate. If you learn to meditate, learn to develop your intuitive side. Then travel around in the non-physical. Go out of body, have lucid dreams, practice remote viewing. Practice healing with your mind. Practice getting data out of the database. Practice all these things. And you can, everyone can, learn how to do these things and be reasonably good at it. And when you are reasonably good at it, it will be perfectly clear that you are more than just your physical body. 
that your consciousness lives in a different space. Not just this physical space, but it has things that it can do, places it can go, things that it, choices it can make that are outside of this space. And once you come to that conclusion through your own personal experience that you are more than your physical body, then the unknown is no longer unknown. You, you've gotten around in consciousness space. And the, uh, you know, the, the fear of death goes away because there is no death. Consciousness is immortal. It continues. So all of those things just drop away. Control isn't the issue. Controlling things isn't what life is all about. Actually, letting go of control is what life is all about. So just experiencing for yourself, I think, is the key here. If you read about it in a book, you listen to me tell you about it, that's eh, an interesting idea, but it isn't going to take your fear away. But if you do it, and anyone who tries, seriously tries, which means practices at it three, or three times a week for a half hour, an hour, you practice at it. Anybody who takes it seriously can learn how to do any of those paranormal things in six months. It's not that hard. It's not like it takes a lifetime or a special talent or anything, you can learn. Now, if you're very, very left brain, if you're very logic dominant, it may take you longer because all of this has to happen on the intuitive side of your consciousness, not on the intellectual side. And if you only see yourself as an intellect, then it's going to take you longer. But if you aren't that unbalanced and you can see yourself as an intellect and an intuition, and you have an intuitive side, then you can in six months develop that intuitive side to the point where you can do paranormal things reliably when you want to, with confidence, you see. And after a decade or so, you actually get good at it. You know? So anyhow, I'd say take the time and the trouble to give yourself firsthand experience that you are more than your physical body. And then you'll see, the, you'll see the, the wisdom in this concept of your physical body is just an avatar, your consciousness. You're not your physical body. You're just the one that makes the choices. So that's how you get over the fear of death and you know, the fear of the unknown and the fear of not being in control. That's good advice. Thank you, Tom. The next question is from Ingo. And um, he's asking, can you use healing methods to get rid of your fears of, say, fear of elevators or heights or flying? Can you use a healing method or how would you um, implement that to help with those things? Okay. Um, those emotions. Okay, you wouldn't use the same tools that you would in healing, you know, the energy bar tool that turns black spots white, you wouldn't be doing those kinds of metaphors. But the things that you could do to help you get rid of fears, um, well, well, we'll take the fear of heights or the fear of elevators. Those two are combined. A lot of times the elevator is scary because it goes up high and could drop. So the fear of heights and the fear of elevators are probably first cousins. And what you can do about that is picture in your mind doing it. Picture in your mind, you know, going up to the top of the Empire State Building and looking over the rail, you know, where you can look over and see New York skyline out ahead of you. A picture going up into high places, so going to the edge of a cliff and looking over the other side. And you do that safely. Picture that in your mind. You walk up to it and you stand there and you look and you walk away from it such that it's a positive experience. You get on that elevator, you push the button, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, and it's okay. You walk out of it. So experience in your mind doing those things and do it a lot. Have that intention of experiencing it fully. So if you go into that elevator, it's not just you in an elevator. It's you walking in, you know, you standing in the lobby. Somebody pushes the button for up. You go in with six or seven other people. 
you go up. The elevator pauses a couple of floors. Some people get off, some people get on. It goes up. People get off, people get on, and it goes up, and then it gets to the top, and then it comes down. And you can ride it to the top and ride it to the down, get all the, all the smells, all the sights, the different people, what they're wearing, the buttons on the panel, you know, all the details. Make it as realistic as possible. Be in that elevator. Experience it. And those experiences of going up and down successfully with nothing bad happening will tend to erode the fear. The fear will have you know, claws that aren't quite as sharp just because you have experienced it many times. But you can't just do it once or twice. You have to do it a lot. You, know, you have to do it every day, maybe for a year, you know, 365 times before it will have a very strong effect and that fear will begin to melt though. Um, people do the same thing when they are uh, uh, trying to work up the courage to go stand up in front of people and give a speech. You know, somebody that's never spoken before in public, probably, unless they're an extreme extrovert, has some fear around the idea, what if I get up there and I can't remember what it is I'm going to say? What if I get up there and, and make a fool of myself? And they have all of these negative consequences of, of it. And it's terrifying to get up there and give this speech. Well, the way you get over that is you do it in your imagination. In your imagination, you give that speech. You give the whole speech from the first word to the end word. Not just pretend that you've given a speech, but actually give the speech, the whole thing in front of an audience. You look at your audience, you see the people, you see various individuals out there, the theater, the blackboard, the whiteboard, the screen, whatever you've got, you see it, screen goes up, screen goes down, you're there and you're giving that talk. You go through the whole thing. If it's an hour talk, take an hour to do it. Give that talk, change your slides. And even if you sit in a room looking at your slides and every time you look at a slide, then you you give that slide. So you go through it in your mind. And after you've done that 50 times, you get up on that stage and it just flows because you've given that speech so many times. It's like you don't even have to think about it. It just rolls and it seems very natural. It seems fluid. It seems like you have absolutely no fear at all. And it's a great success. Why? Because you did it in your mind to the point that it became familiar and therefore you weren't afraid of the unknown and you weren't afraid of you know becoming out of control losing control losing what you were thinking about so what you the reason that works that way is that the data is data whether it comes because you make it in your imagination it comes from the system or it comes from another IUOC data is data you get it, you interpret it. That interpretation is your experience. So when you're doing a, a, a pretend um, speech to people or a pretend ride in an elevator or a pretend climbing up the stairs to the top of the Statue of Liberty and gonna look out at the top, when you do those things, then that experience is data. That daydream is data and you interpret it. You're also creating it, but you interpret the data. When you do it in a night dream, it's the same thing. You're getting data, you interpret the data. You do it in the physical world, it's the same thing. You're getting data and you interpret the data. All three of those, daydreams, night dreams, and, and the physical world, all just receiving data, interpreting the data, and then interacting with the data. They're all exactly the same. The same experience in your, in your daydream or your nightdream is not much different than the experience in the physical world. Experience is experience. So even though you've never given a lecture before in front of a lot of people, if you do it in your daydream, by the time you get up, you've given a lecture 20 or 30 times. You're an experienced lecturer at that point, and you've got this. You have confidence and you can do it. You see, it's, it's like that. And going up in elevators or high places or whatever other fears might be will work similarly to that. So you need to have an intent of not having that fear. I just don't want to be like that. You know, you have a, a strong intention about getting rid of the fear. 
and you go through the exercise of doing the fearful thing without fear. It's okay. It always works fine. And that will make it easier to actually do it in the physical world. Now in the dream and in the day, the night dream and daydream, there, you don't have the consequences that you have in the physical. In the physical, those elevator cables could just break and you could fall. Whereas in the daydream, it doesn't matter whether they break or not, you just wake up. But if you look at the probabilities, the probabilities are terribly small that elevator cables are going to break, that airplanes are going to fall out of the sky, that the Statue of Liberty is going to fall over while you're in the top, or that somebody's going to throw you out. You know, all of those probabilities are minuscule. Very, 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 very unlikely to happen. So that's your intellectual part, though. Your fear is not rational. Your fear doesn't care how, imp you know, how improbable it is. It's just afraid. And that's why practice will make that fear go away doing it. So data is data. It all experience is equally valid, no matter what reality you're in. And it all adds really to the same thing. I think that's going to be super helpful for people. It's really interesting. We'll go on to the next question from Dom, MBT Forum. Um, basically, the LCS would create an inter interface that I would interpret to be a pet critter or something close that I take responsibility for. Now this is concerning recurring dreams. I would immediately become terrified and act in a way that I would not do in physical reality. Um, he understands that this is some sort of fear test, but he's trying to figure out what it would mean and the underlying significance of it and how to overcome it. Okay, I'm not sure I understand the fear. Does he, uh, what does this have to do with a pet? Well, it's just a recurring dream that he has that he would be given something like a pet, a critter, or something close to me that I would take responsibility for. Um, the critter would exhibit love and, and connection, but for some strange reason, he would become immediately terrified and act in a way that he wouldn't normally act in this physical world. And he's wondering how he can sort that out. He knows it's sort of some sort of a fear test, but how can he sort that out to find the significance or how to overcome that? Well, sometimes in fear tests, well, many times in fear tests, you're just placed into a situation. You're just dropped in the middle of a situation. And it's how are you going to react to that? Often the situation you're placed into is not one that you would ever get yourself into. It's not one you would ever actually do. It's not the way you would actually be, but you just dropped in the middle of it to see what you're going to do with it. What do you do? So that may be the case here. Um, in other words, if you, well, I'm trying to think of a really good example, but sometimes you'll be dropped into a situation where you're doing something that you would never do. You know, here you are, and suddenly you're in this crowd of people, and you reach down and you grab this kid and you start beating him up. And you'd never hit a kid. But now, there you are, and suddenly the dream starts, and you're, you're throttling this eight-year-old, smacking him around, and what are you going to do? Well, immediately you'd stop and say, whoa, what's going on here? Sorry, young man, <laughs> not sure why I did that, you know, and you'd dust him off and do whatever, and you'd think, geez, what got, what got into me? Why did I do that? See, that would be the right answer. But if you have this streak of meanness in you, say, that you've always been covering up and you always smile and act like a nice guy and they drop you into that dream, oh, you wouldn't react like that. You just go ahead and beat the stuffing out of that kid because you're venting frustration. You're venting the mean streak. You're venting the fact that you have this, this negativity, this hostility inside of you and you would continue doing it. So this, sometimes the system will just drop you into a situation 
that is totally out of context for you just to see what you do because it pulls out those things that you wouldn't do otherwise. See, if it's always, if you're always going to be like polite, that mean streak doesn't come out because you always pat little children on the head and you're always polite and you're always nice. And the fact that you have this, this violent streak inside of you doesn't ever show. Well, in dreams, you are who you are. You're at the being level. You, you are just exactly the way you are at the being level. You don't, you don't have that intellect saying, well, I, I need to act nice because all these people, I don't want to show them my main street. I don't want them to see that side of me when I, where I go berserk because I have this fear and something going on. I don't want to show that. When you're in a dream, you are who you are at the being level. You got no cover up. You got no image. You just are. And they'll drop you in a situation because some of those things you might be will come out if they drop you in that. And if they don't, they'll never come out. So the system will sometimes put you into things that are totally out of context for you. And you'll just suddenly be in the middle of it. And of course, the right thing to do is to back out of it immediately once you see it. Whoa, you know, I didn't want to do that. Hey, are you okay? And otherwise, if you just turn around and just start beating somebody because it makes you feel better to beat somebody because you've got this terrible frustration and anger that you've been hiding all the time when you're in the physical, in this virtual reality, in the physical world, you hide it. Dream reality, you can't hide it. So those are the kinds of fear tests. So sometimes your fear test will start totally out of context. Don't worry about it. Just be who you are. Do the things you do. And uh, if you end up having a mean streak, you'll find out <laughs> because you will continue to do the horrible thing after you're let go. It's like you're put in there and then somebody pushes a switch and suddenly action, you know, it's live. And now you see what you've been doing. You get the last 10 seconds of it. And now what do you do? In other words, they're giving you a trigger to trigger that mean streak. And it eh, happens, don't worry about it. It's not, that, it's, not that the, it's not that the system thinks you have a mean streak, it's just that these are standardized tests that people get. And overcoming it is simply um, a way of, um, let's see. Being authentic. You just are who you are. Yeah. You overcome it, because in a dream you can't help it. I mean, you're just there. So there's no way to change your dream. You just are going to be who you are. So you it's need to get rid of work, work yeah, get on rid, it. Yeah, get rid of your fear. If it shows you something about yourself that isn't pretty, don't deny it. Don't push it away. Say, whoops, gee, why did I do that? Okay, there I was beating this kid, but why did I continue to beat him after I was in charge? I can see it happened before because I really wasn't in charge then. It was mm -hmm. just a setup. But once I was in charge, why did I continue? And then you say, well, maybe there's something I should look at. You know, do I have this inner anxiety or core mm -hmm. or frustration? Or, or something to acknowledge. And something, something to, to acknowledge. Yeah. 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 So you'll learn from it. Really interesting uh, for people who have dreams like that. All right. The next question is from Philip on MBT Forum on the measurement of chi energy. Um, I'm interested in the traditional teaching about Feng Shui. In Feng Shui, you try to influence Qi, or the life energy, in a positive way. In order to influence Qi, we would have to know its properties so we can draw conclusions about its behavior. If we don't know how it behaves, we can't really take measures to influence it in a positive or negative way. What can your theory tell us regarding the possibilities to measure Qi energy? Yeah. Well, I'm not as familiar with that. I mean, I'm a little familiar with it. I know of the word and I know of, I've seen, I've seen many videos of the guy from, I'm not sure where, but he, he puts his hands out and he starts fires and he pushes pencils through wooden tables and does all of those things. And he hits people with it. He can like make you, you know, knock you back with the chi energy from Mm -hmm. I've seen all of that, and uh, I no doubt that that is all the way it is. I don't think any of that is made up. Um, so 
the measurement of it would have to be a measurement that you make internally. If you're training, I think this is kind of like, if you're training, how do you measure what it is you're doing with it? If you worry too much about the measurement, you're not gonna be able to do it very well. So first of all, you have to learn to do it entirely from the intuitive side, not from the intellectual side. And that takes a lot of training. That takes a lot of your focus and training to where you can get into the intuitive side and actually start that fire or push the pencil through the tabletop or whatever. You need to be able to do that. And of course you do very small things first. You do things that are, you know, just a little bit of power and that little bit of power, you can feel it, you can sense it, you know, it's there, you get to know it. It becomes a part of you and then you can increase it. So the measurement is really an internal measurement of your, that, that takes place as you grow. It's an internal thing. So that's your primary measurement in the training mode. Now, after you become very, very proficient at it, and you can stay in that intuitive space, even when you're showing it to reporters or showing it to somebody else, you see, and that takes a lot of training just to do that. Most people who are in, who are more beginners, just the fact that they're showing it to somebody would get them out of the theta state into the intellectual space and it wouldn't work. So there's a lot of development go of, of feeling it and you feel it in your body. It's a sense of where you are in your mental space as well. And the mental space and the body all become one thing and you push this, this energy out. So when you get to the point that you can actually demonstrate it, as some people have done, you're pretty advanced because mostly the demonstration itself would get in the way of doing it. The two spaces are not all that compatible. One's an intellectual space of showing something to others and the other's a being level space and they tend to interfere with each other. But if you did get to the point where you could, uh, where you were ready for demonstrations, then you could measure it in all sorts of ways. Obviously, starting a fire is a measurement. Knocking somebody, you know, like they, uh, like I have seen, where it actually moves somebody across the room with the, with that energy, then that's another measurement. You know, how much force could you move? You know, how high can you lift a weight? with that force, you can start making measurements that way. But at that point, it's all demonstration and actually pretty irrelevant to the practice. And at that state, you're a master of it and your measurements are all internal, really. You don't need to do that. All you're doing is showing the world that it's possible. And the only reason to do that is to help them open their minds. And if your reason has something to do with your ego and power, then you're not a master. <laughs> you're probably not that strong at it. It's not going to work very well for, it, for you. So only when you can get to that point to demonstrate and still be humble and still be at the intuitive level, uh, will you be able to you know, do experiments that show the force, show the, the result of the energy that you can, you know, the psychokinetic energy you can create. So measurement's internal all through the training process. You feel it, you're one with it, you know it. But that takes a lot of work to get to the point where you've mastered that and then a lot more work to combine that with the intellect so that you could show others. Just to help open their minds, not to impress them, but just to help open the minds of people to see this as possible. That's very good. Thank you, Tom. Um, one more question from Astral from the MBT forum. Um, Astral says, Tom, I have a question for you, but first I really wanted to share this with you. MBT has saved my life, and I thank you so much. I don't miss a single video that you make. When there are no new videos, I always pick one to watch or listen to way back to your very first ones, or find a random one I have not seen. So. What his question is to do with, he is a, he does, ham, he's a ham radio technician. 
He does a lot of calling in weather reports and things like that. His car looks like a mobile porcupine, he says, <laughs> <laughs> which is really yeah. cute. Um, mm -hmm. He says, his question is with Wi-Fi signals and tap water, um, I want to know if it might not be good for us, um, but it does, does it come down to belief as to whether or not those things affect us exploring the greater reality, or is it um, actually some substance there? It's mm -hmm. some of both. It can be both. It depends on the situation. Belief is a very strong thing as far as intent. Okay. If you have a negative intention, which comes from a negative belief, oh, this stuff is going to hurt me. I've got all this, all this uh, electromagnetic fields all around my place because I've got all these antennas and everything else. And I like high power because that way I get further distances with my uh, short wave. So if, he's, if he does that, then he's concerned about the radiation that he gets. Okay, if he feels that the radiation is going to bother him, if that's a belief, then it probably will, because that's a negative intent that sees a negative outcome. And over years, that negative intent and seeing that negative outcome will produce that negative outcome. So yes, that's the placebo effect. And it's a strong effect because the placebo works both ways. It can make you healthy, it can hurt you. Sometimes people call that the nocebo, which means a, a negative placebo effect. But in any case, it's the same thing. So that is a strong part of anything that you do. Depends on how it makes you feel. Attitude is key. You know, how does it change your attitude? Now, if you are careful <clears throat> not to have the radiator close to you, then you can diminish the effects of it by one over the square of distance, right? Radiation uh, power falls off as one over the square of the distance. So if you are, you know, if you have your cell phone and it's pressed up against your ear and that puts the radiation, particularly if the tower is on the other side of your head, then you've got, you've got a lot of energy going through your central nervous system, through your brain. And that's probably not very healthy. But if you had a cell phone that was somebody else was using and they were three feet away from you, the effect would probably be close to nothing because just that three feet would reduce the signal enough to make it fairly safe. So it depends on where you put your stuff. Try to don't put, don't put your antenna on your bed stand, you know, that would not be clever. But if you put your antenna someplace else that's 10, 20 feet away from you, 30 feet away from you, you're probably fine with the amount of power that a ham radio person has, you know, I mean, you're limited in power. The, the, the laws won't let you go over a certain amount of power. And with that much power, you're probably not going to do anything to yourself if you stay 10, 20 feet away from it, something like that. So, you know, I, I say that as a physicist, you know, as a scientist and, and having done a lot of work with electromagnetic radiation, I'm giving you a little bit of, of idea there. I know you don't want to stop being a ham radio. That's, that's ingrained. That's almost at the genetic level for people who get into that. They're very, uh, you know, they're very committed to that. So, uh, probably break your heart to have to stop that because of you're worried about radiation. So just get your antennas as far away and keep a positive attitude. I'm fine. I'm healthy. I'm going to stay healthy. I'm going to live till I'm 110 and whatever. Just if you have that attitude, then you'll be fine. Now, an attitude of false bravado isn't helpful. That's just a cover up. If you're going around saying, I'll live till I'm 110 and I'm fine and I'm great, but inside you actually feel like, uh-oh, I hope this stuff doesn't hurt me, then it hasn't helped any. The false bravado isn't helpful. It's a cover and it's not going to do much to modify future probability. The negativity is still there and that will be more effective because that's real coming out of the being level. The false bravado is coming out of your intellect, which doesn't have much power, you see. So if you, if you 
when I say be positive, I mean, you really have to be positive, not just act positive and say positive things. You have to be positive. So I think you're fine. Just move your, move your body away from uh, the radiation as much as possible, particularly if the radiation is going out because outgoing radiation transmitting has a lot more power. So don't have your head next to the transmitter. What you receive is very, very small radiation that's bouncing off the ionosphere, you know, from Moscow or some places it travels around the world. And that stuff is so weak that it's not going to have much of an effect. The square, dividing by the square of the distance gives you a, a very, very small uh, signal as you are aware, since you have to go to so much trouble to capture that little signal and to, and to get rid of the noise that masks it. But anything that transmits needs to transmit as far away from you as your property allows and not next to anybody else either. You don't want to take your problem and shove it off on your neighbor. But you know, 10 feet, 20 feet, that's good. That's probably uh, safe enough for what you're doing. Make your antenna radiate maybe directional so it doesn't radiate back. The back lobes aren't that big on your antenna, so it doesn't throw stuff back at you. Let's say if it's up at the roof, so that it throws it up and out. So antenna design can help prevent it. Uh, good antenna design, or even putting a, uh, a grounded metal something for the back lobes to intercept those back lobes and shield, you know, shields around your antenna. So if you got an antenna on the roof, you can maybe put a little you know, aluminum shield around it. As long as you ground it, then that will uh, cast a shadow on you from that radiation. So you won't get you won't get the back lobe effect of that. So those are the things you can do. But attitude is the key element. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tom. It's a very heartfelt letter. I mean, he has some psychic abilities, and he'd like to develop those to help other people. He has certain limitations and challenges and he wanted to know whether these things just so he can be the best he possibly could be he wanted to know whether those things would in, in interfere would interfere with that no so thank there's you there's not there's not going to be any interference with his abilities or anything as long as he doesn't get wrapped up around beliefs that they oh. will then there won't be a problem well thank you tom we have gone through all of the MBT forum questions. Oh, and, good. Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Oh, you're welcome, Donna. Thank you for uh, setting this all up and getting those questions answered. That's, that's, okay. that's a very good thing to do. Pleasure. Tom Campbell here. I and MBT events. Hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured. We will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our newly created Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.